All right, I guess we can get started. So uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever on this globe you are. Uh, thank you for joining my talk on uh, GDPR's right to be forgotten in Apache Hadoop Ozone. Uh, so a little bit about me, I'm Dinesh Shitlangya. Uh, been a software engineer since 2010 um, in the distributed system Hadoop world since 2016. Uh, Apache Hadoop committer and currently working as uh, a premier support tech lead at Cloudera. Uh, and uh, here are the other details of and ways of reaching out uh, to me. So uh, in, in this talk, right, uh, I know we are going to talk about Ozone and we're going to talk about uh, GDPR, but uh, a little bit of context around why Ozone was needed uh, to begin with. Uh, so some of you may have attended yesterday's talk by Martin. Uh, in case you did that, this will all sound uh, familiar grounds to you. But otherwise, I'll just do a quick overview of Ozone and why Ozone was needed in the first place. So uh, as we know, right, HDFS offers way beyond a scale and performance. Like It's pointless to talk about the kind of scale and uh, performance HDFS gives because it's been used across the globe in massive uh, data systems at scale, right? So uh, that's a known fact. So other features that HDFS really brings in is a strongly consistent, right? So it makes life easy for our application developers. So for example, you know, when you have name node HA enabled, uh, you don't need to know which name node should your app go and submit a job to, so, right? You will just take the HA URL and then internally the name node will figure out which one is the active one and then uh, it will read out DAP accordingly. It's reliable, right? So say for example, all your nodes got shut down or you know you had a power outage or something in your data center, uh, you are pretty much assured that when you plug in the systems back and restart, uh, your name nodes and your HDFS cluster will return in a very consistent uh, state, even from such catastrophic failures, right? Now the third very important and probably one of the most underrated features of HDFS is the file system API, right? Uh, the Hadoop file system API, uh, because of which various other Apache projects like Hive, Spark, HBase, uh, you know, are able to connect to the HDFS systems. And not only these projects, but you can eventually connect with the cloud like the Azure storage or the S3 storage using that file system compatible API. Aside from this, uh, security is obviously a very, very robust uh, area in HDFS. We have Kerberos, we have encryption at rest, encryption in motion, we have POS6 ACLs as well, right? Uh, but that said, right, every, uh, there is no system which is ideal in the world. Uh, so of course, you know, for HDFS, we have the one famous limitation uh, of uh, scaling to up to say 350 million files. And thereafter we run into problems with heap size and the file count and all that. Of course, this is not a problem when you're storing large files. Um, uh, it's primarily related to the small files in the system. And what ends up happening is we run out of name node heap long before we run out of any cluster disk space, right? So in the community uh, over the last decade and a half, uh, several solutions have been proposed, right? Uh, for example, we can grow the heap so ZGC claims support for 16 terabyte heaps, but at that kind of heap, the 10X to 100X scale from the current 350 million is uh, still going to be impractical. The other option is, yeah, you know, you can use less heap if you can't manage with higher heap, but then uh, uh, what are the ideas for that, right? So the ideas were uh, you scale the namespace accordingly, right? So what you do is instead of loading the entire namespace in your memory, uh, like what Tabenot does today, we can just load a working set in the memory, or you can uh, segregate the block manager as a service, right? So all these uh, ideas were pitched in various uh, HDFS JIRAs by the community. And uh, one other area was like the block reports are very heavy. So as your cluster grows in terms of number of nodes and number of blocks, uh, those block reports also make the name node a bit choked. So achieving that 10x to 100x scales then becomes uh, fairly impossible with the current setup. 
so these are the lessons we learned from hdfs right so one key lesson is uh, keep only the working set in ram we do not need to load the entire namespace uh, in memory and then the other idea is to decouple the namespace and the block space right so it was uh, originally proposed by uh, yahoo uh, via the hdfs 5477 jira so what this will do is uh, if your namespace and your block space are decoupled uh, basically it will allow you to scale or shard independently of each other so if you are in a scenario where you know you're going to have a lot of small files um, you would just want to scale the namespace not the block space and if you are in a scenario where say you only dump large files into the system uh, say for example you are, you belong to the self driving car world or the robotic surgery kind of world right where you'll generally not get many files but what you'll get is very large files so that case you don't really have a lot of pressure on your namespace but you would just like to increase the uh, scale the block space so by decoupling it allows us to scale or shard uh, in them independently as needed uh, the other lesson is obviously we need to get rid of block reports because as the cluster grows uh, the number of files the number of blocks increases and since we are tracking each and every block in a block report it just becomes a little bit too much for the name node uh, after a certain point in time uh there was a notion of volumes uh, that was introduced in hdfs but never really implemented so that is something we also picked up uh, from hdfs so that said uh, what are the building blocks of ozone right so ozone uh, we had primarily three tenets of you know we want to incorporate when building ozone so one is we wanted to have strong consistency uh, otherwise the system is just not reliable as a file storage and then we wanted to have a simple architecture because that would then uh, make it easy to manage from an operation standpoint so the building blocks of ozone are pretty straightforward we have a raft replication uh, protocol uh, which is an open source java implementation uh, in the apache ratis project so this takes care of the consensus and the replica management and pipeline and all that and then we have the storage containers uh, which um, i know is a very heavy used uh, heavily used term container uh, so these are not your standard linux container or your docker containers and stuff like that this is a logical abstraction um, within the data node so the storage containers in ozone use the key store key value store called rocksdb and rocksdb um, i'm sure you guys are aware is a very very battle tested solution for the key value stores which was a fork of level db of course and then we have the hdds layer which is essentially the container management layer or you could equivalently say it's the block management layer uh, of course here we don't manage individual blocks because they are grouped as storage containers and hence we say storage uh, distributed container management layer so that's hdds hadoop distributed data store and finally we have our ozone manager which is the namespace manager uh, equivalent of the name node in the hdfs world now so what are storage containers as i was saying right storage container is basically a collection of blocks and the default size is 5 gigabyte so we will you know aggregate the report for a container uh, and for all these blocks and then send it to the namespace manager instead of just sending reports for each and every block so storage maintain is basically uh, storage container is basically a um, unit of replication right it solves the block report scale problem uh, as i was saying we have the raft protocol implemented so that takes care of syncing the replicas and the consensus be between who's the leader and who's the follower and all those stuff uh, these containers are stored on data nodes and thus they are managed by the uh, storage container manager uh, and i was as i was saying these are equivalent to the hdfs uh, block manager so what are uh, the ozone architecture right the overall uh, view so as i was saying earlier we have three key components right we have the ozone manager and we have the storage container manager the namespace and the block manager respectively and then we have a set of data nodes now on your left uh, what you're seeing is basically the various ways in which a user could connect to the ozone system so when you have the uh, file system connector and then you have the command line shell and then uh, we would also like to you know introduce this idea that 
Ozone is not just a standard file system. It's basically an object store for big data. So we have a similar feature like the S3 gateway servers, which obviously you would want to have it load balanced in a production scenario. Now on the right, uh, what you see is the recon server and the Ozone console. So operationally, it has been very challenging for uh, HDFS admins, right? If they run into a problem with a certain file or the state of the file system, they are forced to run something like the HDFS, uh, DFS, FSCK command, right? Uh, the challenge with that is if it's a large cluster, it can take a pretty long time and it uh, is not very optimal to run that. So with the recon server, what will end up happening is you'll get a live view of the state of the file system. Thereby, you never really have to run something like an FSCK command. And Ozone Console is again, you know, provides much more insights about the file system and the metrics and all that. So operationally, uh, these are tools that will help the administrators to monitor the system and then learn more about the health of the system. So uh, before we dive further, you know, Ozone jargons. Uh, so of course, in Ozone, what we have is an Ozone path. Uh, which is like you know volume followed by the bucket name followed by the key name right so on and so forth and volume is a basic unit of administration so what we would essentially do is um, say an admin would create a volume which could relate to maybe one business group right and then the users could also go ahead and create buckets uh, within that volume so bucket is nothing an equivalent of directory so a, a volumes could have you know zero or more buckets and eventually, uh, buckets will contain the keys, basically the files that you want to upload in the system. Uh, so key names are unique within a given bucket. And there is no hard-coded limit on the size of the keys. Uh, and the values can range, obviously, from you know empty files to anything uh, above. So uh, with that architecture and with that introduction of uh, Ozone, uh, it obviously gives us an ease of operation, right? Because we are using off heap memory. So there is no problem of large Java heaps or doing the guesswork around what GC parameters to put in place. It's a simplified HA model because um, Ozone by default is HA enabled and uh, the replicas communicate via the raft protocol. And uh, there is no more uh, complexity of implementing journal nodes uh, you know, like three journal nodes at least, and then two ZKFC processes, at least three zookeepers, right? So, I mean, if you've uh, managed or implemented a Hadoop cluster, you know this part really becomes painful, especially when there is some instability in the system. And this is so much more you need to spend basically to have these kind of components running. Uh, of course, the SCM ships with its own certificate server. So what ends up happening is uh, it will automatically, when you add a data node into the system, it will basically authenticate itself using that certificate. So you no longer have a scenario where, say if you have a 3000 node cluster, um, for each data node, you do not have to create a Kerberos principles. Uh, and I've seen that in the past, you know, some customers or some users will end up bypassing that and will simply use a generic principle by using the wildcard. Uh, of asterisk, which is obviously defeats the purpose of having that security. So it's come, you know, it ships with its own certificate server that makes it easy to manage uh, uh, the principal creation and all for each and every data node because there's no longer a need to create those principles. And as I was saying earlier, recon server it provides a live view of the file system state, so you never have to run something like IFSCK again. And um, you know, over the last decade and a half, people have seen that managing the client configurations uh, sometimes becomes difficult because you need to ship those same site files in every node. And sometimes uh, in multi-tenant systems, what we have observed is, although you may have a Hadoop cluster being managed by a centralized administration tool, like a Cloud Era Manager or an Ambari, but there will always be some edge nodes which are not managed by these uh, management consoles. So keeping the configuration in sync is obviously a challenge and you run into situations where people use incorrect client configs and jobs failed and could not get submitted. So in Ozone, what will happen is, uh, you know, we, the client will basically directly contact the Ozone manager server and get the configs. So that will simplify this process. Now, a uh, write key uh, in Ozone is basically same as um, what we have in 
the HDFS world, right? So a client calls a put key on Ozone Manager. Ozone Manager will always have some pre-allocated blocks, uh, uh, you know, and container pipeline combinations from SCM. Uh, so once the Ozone Manager will share these uh, alloc blocks to the client, client will directly talk to that particular data node wherever those blocks are, uh, write the data as chunks and update the metadata. And once the client is done writing, it will on Ozone Manager, which is nothing but a, you know, close the file, I'm done with it kind of situation. Read again is pretty much very similar to the HDFS path. Client says uh, to Ozone Manager, uh, get me this key, and then Ozone Manager brings the key location infos. Once the info is available to client, it goes directly to that data nodes and then reads the data blocks as chunks. Now, um, let me just break out of this slide for a moment and then uh, let's go see what's happening here. Uh, so let's put this website in. Um, and I've observed that this website does run a bit slow. So. <laughs> So basically, this is the GDPR enforcement tracker website, uh, and you will always get a live view of every GDPR violation that happens and the fines that are imposed on whichever entity for whatever reason. So you know, you're, we can see on top, right, some new fine amount of 35 million euros for you know which company like that. Uh, and uh, if you scroll down further, you'll see massive amount of fines being imposed on very, very popular names as well as the not so popular business names. So this site is basically our window, uh, which tells us, okay, where all the GDPR violations uh, are serious and it's not to be taken very lightly. Now the talk that we have today is for the right to be forgotten, which comes under article 17 of GDPR. So if I search for article 17, uh, again, I'll find a lot of, um, you know, situations where people have been given massive fines. So this is just to demonstrate that right to be forgotten is a topic, especially when it comes to GDPR compliance, right? My slide deck. So these are some of the you know big names that got fined uh, earlier um, this year and the year before that, uh, once the GDPR violations took a serious turn. So what is the GDPR concept, right? So it's, it's a European Union uh, concept, right? It's called the General Data Protection Regulation. So of course, I've written a lot of bunch of things on the slide, but in essence, what it is, is it's a set of guidelines and rules uh, for data controllers, right? Because you are taking someone else's data and managing as part of your business or as part of your commercial enterprise or whatever may be the case, right? So in that scenario, uh, somebody has to be held accountable. Somebody has to take the ownership uh, and manage the data processes, right? So GDPR basically defines certain framework, a uh, set of rules on what the data compliers need to be, uh, do, you know, to be compliant with their guidelines. And then what happens uh, if you end up, say, violating a particular rule or a particular article in this framework? Although it's in European law, but what happens is sometimes you might have, a, say, an American company uh, who has data of um, you know, EU citizens. So in that kind of a scenario, although the company is not in Europe, um, but it still will have to comply with the GDPR uh, laws, right? So with storage systems and GDPR, what is our challenge, right? Uh, the first one is the territorial scope, right? So in, in the olden days, yeah, you would have a scenario where the data stays in that geography and your storage system is in that geography. But now with the advent of cloud and you know all the other failover mechanisms, people want to have multiple replicas of data. And oftentimes they will also have uh, offshore replicas. So that brings a complexity of the tutorial scope. Then the challenge is about the personal data that anybody stores in the system. And there comes the right to erasure. It is one of the principles in GDPR. It is also known as right to be forgotten. So what it means is um, 
say for example i'm an eu citizen and i'm on facebook and i have uploaded some photos or you know some stuff there on facebook as an eu citizen it gives me a right to just go on uh, to facebook and ask them to delete all my data from all their systems all their backups and everything and facebook because is the data controller in this scenario it has a notification obligation so what that means is that facebook has to give me in writing that yes i have deleted all your data and for whatever reason we find that it's not true some amount of data is still left somewhere right so that counts as a gdpr compliance uh, violation and thereby you know the organization might be fined so this is the kind of problem statement that we are trying to solve now historically in large and distributed systems what we have seen is the actual data blocks will get deleted you know much later so how do you as a controller uh, you know can certify that yes i have deleted this data uh, and you know we have complied with the gdpr regulations right so that is the problem that we'll talk about so this is the delete path um, of ozone a client calls a delete key on ozone manager uh, then the ozone manager calls the same method on scm scm goes to the data nodes which has those containers and it will call the delete blocks but even before all this happens the moment ozone manager gets the delete key request it acknowledges that the key has been deleted right right after it communicates to scm but the actual data blocks are still there in the system now under the hood what happens once the ozone manager gets the delete key request um, in the memory it has a table called you know deleted keys table where it moves the information about that particular key which the client wants to delete so in the ozone manager there is also a key deleting service which runs periodically right so it just checks uh, after every certain period of time it will tell the storage container hey these are the new set of keys i'd like you to delete storage manager acknowledges that and after that the key deleting service will empty the table because the message has been passed and as i was saying right um, the so, uh, the storage container manager will then you know create a deleted block manifest it will sort it by do- data nodes because uh you know containers will be residing on the data nodes and then it will send those manifests to data node and then you know uh, there is an internal process by which the data node will eventually pick up that manifest and clear all the block so with this the problem is that we don't know when exactly it will be deleted and since we don't know when exactly it will be deleted there is almost no way uh you know by which you can certify that i have complied with the gdpr uh, situation and uh, and i can assure in writing that the data has been deleted so how do we address this problem in ozone so in ozone we thought okay um, why don't we lose the encryption key right so if you don't know the key with which the data was encoded there is no way for you to decode so the data is virtually uh, considered lost right so what we do in ozone is um, we introduced a flag in the bucket creation commands where you can specify whether it's a gdpr enabled bucket or not once such a bucket is created and if a client now wants to write a key in that particular bucket it will first generate a simple encryption key and the client will use the key to encode and write that data to blocks so the blocks you know obviously are written in the encoded format now when the client wants to read the same blocks again uh, it will pick up the encryption key from the memory right from the key info uh, for each key and will use that key to decode it and then go ahead and uh, you know reveal the data so what we did is um, during the delete phase right i was saying that the uh, let me go back to the previous slide um, yeah so right here so every time we issue a delete key command the ozone manager will move the key info to the deleted keys section so when it does that uh, what we are doing is we are getting rid of the encryption key from the key info object so now what happens is once deleted keys table right the key info is here the associated encryption key 
doesn't exist because it has been deleted from this object. Now, since your option key is irrevocably lost, there is no way that the data can be decoded. Even if you know the actual blocks are deleted much later, or even if you are somehow able to get into the data node uh, where the actual blocks are residing. With this, the notification of obligation is achieved because there is no way that anybody could get those data or files or the blocks uh, even after being deleted, right? Because even if they get it, they can't read it. So I've left a link here uh, where it will talk in much detail about the design uh, of this feature and how you can enable this uh, bucket and this GDPR concept on Ozo. So of course, uh, you know, there are some known limitations of this system. Um, so first one is backups and restore. As I was saying, right, Ozone uses um, RocksDB layer for the metadata. So if you were backing up the metadata and you would end up restoring uh, the metadata after say deleting some files, yeah, the keys will come up in the namespace again. So that is a limitation. That is something that we are, we have a proposal to uh, address this restore scenario in future. That when you restore, we can also provide the audit logs up until that point. And then the restore functionality would basically take care and delete such keys before it makes the system available for users. But it's a proposal, it's not yet, um, committed uh, you know when this will be done the other scenario is when you create and delete keys quickly right with the same key name and the same uh, volume bucket path sometimes it can end up generating false positives because uh, let's say you created a key called key one and then you deleted it and now i ask you to certify and you said okay your key is deleted but right after that, if you are you know, continuously creating and deleting with the same name, it will obviously lead to false positives. And uh, the last limitation is that if you have existing buckets that are not GDPR enabled, then you cannot just turn on the flag and uh, you know, make the entire bucket as GDPR compliant. You basically would need to copy the blocks or the data from those buckets into a new gdpr enabled bucket so this is just like uh, encryption zones uh, in hdfs right the files need to be copied out and then back in again that kind of a scenario so these are the limitations um, and then talking about the ozone roadmap so ozone uh, recently went uh, ga uh, with version 1.0.0 uh, of course before it went ga there were uh, several alpha and a beta release uh, over the last couple of years. And uh, the GA feature release basically has end-to-end -end security, TDE, uh, Ozone Manager HA, S3 API support, network topology awareness. Uh, it's been tested with certain Apache projects like Hive, Yarn, uh, MapReduce, Impala, and Spark. And there is some uh, you know, ongoing tests with some of the other Apache projects like HBase, NiFi, Kudu, and so on. Uh, so there is an ongoing proposal for uh, Apache Hadoop Ozone to be carved out as a separate Apache top-level project in the community. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and then there is a future work to include uh, features like erasure coding, uh, SCMHA, HDFS to Ozone upgrade, Ozone to Ozone upgrade, and then uh, hardened support for some of the other Apache projects like Edgebase, NiFi. Uh, based on the community and the user demand. So uh, with that, uh, here is the reference slide. You can follow us on Twitter. We have a video series where we talk about some of the internal concepts of Ozone. And if you are a developer, then we talk about, okay, how do you set up the environment? How do you debug uh, Ozone in an IDE? And how can you play around with it from a developer standpoint? Uh, if you'd like to learn more or get started with Ozone, you can check out our website. Uh, we also have an official uh, roadmap wiki and a community weekly meeting, which happens for two time zones. One is that caters for more, uh, you know, the Asia Pacific region, uh, and it happens in a more friendly time for them. And then one happens in uh, uh, the North American EDT timeline. 
so those meetings are obviously open to uh, the community so anybody can join in and if you have more questions we would be uh, happy to hear from you uh, there as well uh, so with that said uh, you know it's an end of this presentation but at this point i will uh, just check if uh, questions oh that's quite a lot so let's see so first question is is it possible to use ozone as a drop in replacement for hdfs from client api perspective uh, yes it would be possible um, because what we would do is as i said right the clients will pick up the configuration from ozone manager so there is a design proposal out there on if you have a hdfs cluster and you want to upgrade it to ozone right so that the new clients will just point to the new api and then that's it it would work as is you don't have to make any more app changes about oh get 20 other files and things like that uh, so the next question is how strong is the encryption for keys when gdpr is enabled i guess it is symmetric probably aes yes that is correct so right now we are um, using a 128 bit but uh, there is also a proposal to allow and make it configurable instead of 128 you might want to use 256 or whatever right so there is a proposal to make it configurable right now it's not configurable it's using a default of 128 now in terms of how strong it is um so i'm not gonna go there because uh, that stat is out there uh an aes 128 bit is fairly difficult to crack so <laughs> i'll leave it at that and um if it adds any confidence, um, NSA uh, also uses 128-bit AES uh, for a lot of their uh, top secret stuff. Uh, next question is, and can we use the libhdfs API to access data stored in Ozone? I am not very familiar with libhdfs API, but um, if you would uh, like to join in any of our community meetings, I would definitely help you to get the answer for that or otherwise you could just buzz me on twitter and uh, so that i have your contact i can get back to you on that right uh, next question is so is this possible only at bucket level yes so gdpr what we want to do is we do not want to enable at file level right um, because if you are certain organization right you have a set of files that you would be like enable it's just like the encryption zone concept in hdfs so it will only happen at bucket level now there is some uh, discussion in the community that's going on on whether we want to make a volume also as gdpr enabled so what would end up happening is all buckets under that volume will be gdpr enabled so this is more of a feasibility check on whether we want to do that or not but it's a fairly small change it's like a maybe a 10 line patch to make that change happen but uh, today it only happens at bucket level if non gdpr data is deleted at what point is it actually deleted? Does it wait for a certain number of deletes in a container or a time threshold? So actually it's a time threshold. So what happens is, uh, as I was explaining the delete path, uh, once the delete instruction is passed from ozone manager to SCM, SCM waits for a certain time, it prepares the deleted block manifest uh, and sorts them by data node, right? And then it sends those manifests to the data nodes. And then data nodes take their time to delete the blocks. But I do not recall right off the top of my head on what that timeline is and uh, what is the periodic check interval. But yeah, right now it happens based on time. So next question, thanks for the presentation. What's planned for existing HDFS users to migrate Ozone and how the security works as it works for both object and file? So the first question, uh, HDFS uses to migrate Ozone. Yes, there is an ongoing uh, design work that's happening, which is about uh, if you take an HDFS cluster, can I do an in-place upgrade and you know convert it to a new cluster? So that is uh, going. So hopefully it will be you know available soon once we finalize and harden the design and go ahead and implement it. And then your second question was how the security works as it works for both object and file. Yes, so security is, uh, you know, obviously works at both levels. So depending on how strong you want the security, you want TDE, 
so even your blocks will be encoded at the end of the day. You can't really read anything uh, if you don't have the right set of keys to decode. And security is pretty much, you know, you have Kerberos, you have TDE, um, and, you know, you have certificates and all that. So it's end to end. Okay. And then we have another question which says, all the existing HDFS will be features will be available. Um, that's a good question. So I would say, as a file system, whatever features it needs, it would have. Additional is it would behave as an object store as well. So you you would get a little bit more over there. Uh, like storage types, trash. So trash is an ongoing feature. That's a very good question. Uh, trash in Ozone is an ongoing feature. And there is a ongoing work going on for um, truncate and append as well, right? Uh, so I guess, yeah, that's all the question I have, uh, but I'll still hang around for a few more minutes if some more questions come up. And I see appreciations from a few folks. So thank you so much for listening in. Uh, I was glad it was um, worth listening. <laughs> All right, I guess I can terminate the session now um, and we'll move on to the other talks at ApacheCon. And have a happy ApacheCon. Thank you for joining.